All right, so we're, we've now hit week two, and we'll get into it. At least we can have demonstrations this week. Now, last week I spoke about shells. I guess I'm going to talk about it again. Just, you know, as a reminder, I did go through the slideshow as a reminder what text's in it today. Um, a shell is a command interpreter. When you first log into Linux and you open up a terminal, you will get basically a command prompt, a bit like what you have in Windows with the CMD or PowerShell or in Mac when you open up a terminal. They can be used interactive or non-interactive, depending on what you're doing. And I covered that last week, so I'm going to skip that. So, shells. To find out what the available shells are in your system, you type that command. I'm actually going to demonstrate that. And these are the shells that have been installed. There's SH, which is the original, original shell from way back in the Unix days. There's bash, dash, and rbash, and these are just different versions basically of bash. And when you want to find out what your shell is, it's echo dollar sign shell. Now, shell, this right here is an environment variable. These are variables that are defined automatically by the operating system you're using. Echo means, well, print. Same as it is in DOS. Come on. And I'm currently using bash. Um, built-ins, I spoke about those last week. Those are built-in utilities. For example, help will list all the built-in utilities. So if I type in the word help, and now we have tons and tons of noise that showed up on the screen. But these are all the built-ins, so law, local, logout, printf, hey, printf, everyone. Um, DIRS, disown, continue, all kinds of commands. These are basically, um, it's as if you were able to go into Java and type in a command called help, and it would tell you every built-in Java command that's not part of a class or a utility. So it would show you the fours, the whiles, which, you know, you can see. There's four. There's our while command. Basically, these are the programming structures you have available to you inside the bash file, uh, bash script. Now, there's some basic commands for Linux that you, I wanted to demonstrate last week, and I'll show them this week. And actually, which if you wonder what I just typed, it's clear. It clears your screen. So it gets rid of all the noise off the screen. The um, first command, this one started with rmdir, but I'll start with mkdir, which is make directory. Okay, I created a directory called hello20w. ls lists the directories, and here's my hello20w that I just created. RM lets you kill files. In here, as you can see, there's a clock file, file, ls out, and stuff like that. So if I go RM clock, and I go ls again, clock is gone. And RM file 2, file 2 is gone. That's the usual one. Now, let's say I want to nuke a directory in the files that are inside of it. So in here, I create a file called test. If you go rm-r, which is that directory, no prompts, nothing, and now the directory is gone, and it, so is that file that I just created. I created a file, I deleted the file, dash r means recursive delete. It deletes pretty much everything that's under there. There's one command you can't do, which is rm-r slash. Most Linux operating systems will no longer allow you to run that command. Why not? Because it would wipe out your entire disk, including all your everything. It's as if you deleted everything under your C drive on Windows. Now, show a few of these other commands. Passwd you guys have played with in lab one. That's when you're changing the password of root. You can change the password of any user if you have the, the appropriate privileges. So if you're root, you can change anyone's password. 
or you can change your own password, or if you're not root, you can change somebody else's password by becoming root. That one I'm not going to play with, but I'll show you guys. There's who am I? Currently I'm root. I logged in as root for the demonstration to save myself some grief. So who am I shows you who you are. So when you become someone else, I can't remember what I called myself. Ah. Uh, Now if I do who am I here, it shows that I'm that instead of root. So because I became someone else, now I'm no longer root, I'm this other person. Yes? You can, you can do use hyphen R to remove files. It'll delete everything in the current direct, the directory you selected down. Files and all. Now, if there's a file in there that you're not allowed to delete for whatever reason, you can also force it unless you don't have permissions. So if the file was marked as read-only or delete protected, then you can't use dash R. You have to include the force, which is F. Again, I exited being that user, and I'm who am I? I'm back to being root. Uh, host name tells you what the machine's called. A, for those of you that are used to using the internet, and hopefully all of you by now are used to using the internet, when you type in an address in the URL, you know, www.algonquincollege.com, www.algonquincollege.com is a host name. It resolves to a host somewhere on the internet that just so happens that you can have a bunch of hosts sitting on the same machine. But host name is the name of your current machine. Uh, you name, you guys also did in the first lab. In this case, you name tells me what operating system I'm running. Congratulations, I'm running Linux. If I go you name dash A, it tells me I'm running Linux, that my machine is called this. This is the version of the kernel I'm running. It shows that I'm running 1604.1, running symmetric multiprocessor kernel running 64-bit window, uh, Linux, and on and on and on and on. So it tells me what operating system, what bit level I'm at, uh, Matt, all that jazz. And earlier you saw me type in the SU command. SU stands for switch user. It allows you to become someone else. Now, if you're not root and you type in the SU command, it's going to ask you for a password. You need to know the, the password of the user you're becoming. Unless you're root, then you can just become that person. It's magic. Um, oh yeah, LS. LS is the same thing as DIR and DOS. So when you guys learned DOS last, or PowerShell, whatever they're teaching you guys in Computer Essentials nowadays, LS is, um, list, basically. And there's a few arguments. There's uh, some handy ones. ls-l is long. Normal default ls is short. Long is, it includes your permissions on the file. I can't remember what that one is. Damn. Who owns the file? What group the file belongs to? The size of the file. As you can see, all directories are 4K. When was the file created? Now as you can see, I created these directories last March when I was teaching this class. Just go show it doesn't change very much. And then the name of the file. And uh, yeah. So also if I do ls-a, now you'll see a bunch of other files just showed up. In Linux, there's something special about files that start with a period. They're hidden. So you know how on Windows you can mark a file as hidden? So if you go right-click properties on a file, you can mark it as hidden, it suddenly disappears out of your view unless you have show hidden files turned on. On Linux, Unix, and Mac, because Mac is just Unix, they 
if you prefix a file with just a period, so dot, whatever it is, it becomes a hidden file. It is hidden from the regular ls. As you can see, there's no dot ones, but if I go ls-la, which means all files, you'll see that it's including all these hidden files, hidden directories. So if ever you're not sure where something is, but your shirt's in this directory, do an LA. It'll show you the long listing and it'll show you the hidden files. Um, CD is exactly the way you expect it to be. Just like on DOS, CD changes directory. It's exciting. So I'm at the root of my operating system now. And you can see all kinds of stuff in here. All the usual directories you'd find. Um, these are the kernel files that lets the computer boot. Same thing here. Now, I'm going to go... Oh, I can't type today. So you can give it as long a path as you want. You can also use relative paths. Remember I was talking about relative path last week. Dot dot means relative. From current position, move up one. Up from here, now we're going to go over to share. So I'm just going to, it says if I take, I'm in this room, I walk out of this room and then walk into T117. I just went down, went up one and then down one. And now I'm in a different directory. Um, again, you can also go CD tilde which brings you home, shows I'm in slash root. I can also go, if I go CD, also brings me home, same difference. And you can go CD home slash whatever, or if you're root, you go slash root. And that also brings you home. So there's the joy that is CD. PWD, you've seen me use it a few times, present working directory. So you know how yeah, earlier there was a command called who am I? This is where am I? And I've actually seen people create an alias, which is an alternate name for command. They actually called it where am I? Instead of typing PWD, they like typing in the whole word where am I for some unknown reason. Uh, MKDIR makes a directory. Um, one of the cool tricks that Linux has that Windows doesn't have and DOS doesn't have, is you can create a whole directory structure. So if I go, actually, oh look at this, I've got tons of stuff already in here. So, here you can see I have an empty directory. Example, example one, example one dash one. Now I've got just the directory called example, but if I go, there's a command called tree. It doesn't get installed by default, but I, I installed it because I wanted to show you guys what it does. It built all the directories below it also in a single command. In DOS, normally what you do is you'd go, um, I think you create the directory, so mkdir example, then you have to cd into example, then you go mkdir example one, mkdir example two, go into those directories one by one and create the directories as needed. Linux lets you build, lets you build the whole tree structure in one go. Um, it's handy when you're trying to build structures based on the contents of other files. Um, RMDIR. So if I go RMDIR, example, I'm not allowed to delete example because it's full. It, there's stuff inside of it. You can't delete a directory when there's stuff in it unless you're using the RM command with the recursive. Now, what you can do is, up here I had, I'm going to use one I already had so I don't have to type the whole thing in again. 
If I want to get rid of the entire example 2 block, this section right here, I can tell it, delete this section here, example all of that, and it'll dive down and get rid of those, including its parent directories. And I'm not allowed to do that either. But what you can see is it did delete the child directories. They're gone. So if mkdir-p creates a directory structure, irm-rmdir-p will get rid of the directory structure from the lowest level all the, and climb up to the parent. Um, so that's the commands you have for moving around the file system to create directories, to remove directories, to delete files. These are the, the typical things you do on any operating system. In Windows, most people are just used to, you know, click, hit the delete key, click, right click, delete, drag and drop to the garbage can, you know, that kind of stuff. Uh, you can do all that from the command line also. It's just, you know, a little more text based in this world. Uh, you can do, do all this also from the Linux UI, just like you would in Windows. Uh, but the thing is, is if ever you're dealing with Linux, and most of the time, you're not going to deal with it on the desktop, you're going to deal with the servers. Most people install Linux without the desktop component when it's running on a server because you don't want to waste the resources of running a GUI when there's no GUI required. Therefore, learning the, the text-based commands is kind of handy because it's all you're going to have at some point. Now, there's another command called more. More is really handy. More lets you view the contents of a file page by page or the content or the output of a command page by page. So for example, uh, oh man. There we go. So there's a file called D message right here. And my mouse has stopped responding. D message right here. And interesting, it's not giving me the size of the file. If I go, oh, that's why there's nothing inside. All right, boot log. As you can see, there's a fair amount of stuff in here, more than one screen's worth. If I use more, what it'll do is it'll let me page through the file one screen full at a time. So this one's doing whatever number of lines that is. I hit the tab, it moves the spacebar, so spacebar will move through the file. Um, you can search through the file. Um, also, so if I do, I'll bring this one back up and I go slash. Now, do you guys learn about regex yet? Regular expressions? Uh, we're going to keep this as simple as we're going to search for the word file. And it's not working. Pattern not found. Why not working for me today? So I'm searching for the word start and it's jumped me to 50. That's going to jump to 72. It's basically bringing through a screen full of what it's finding. Um, you can use more to search through files. You can also use more on very large directory listings. So if I go back to etc, as you can see, there's a lot of files in here, especially if I do ls-la, there's, you know, lots and lots in here. If I go ls-la, it's called pipe. For those of you who are wondering, and if you have a normal keyboard on your laptop, it's above the enter key. It's the, back, the backslash key. So if you do shift backslash, it'll give you pipe. Pipe means give it to the next command. 
Well, actually, I do talk about redirecting later. So if I go ls-la more, now it's going to give me the results of my large ls one page at a time. As you can see, there's a lot of files in the etc directory. So that's the command. In actual fact, that last example I used is the example on the slide. Um, man in info shows you some help. So if I go man ls, shows you all the arguments ls can take. And you can scroll through it back and forth. Um, you can search through it. It'll highlight what you're searching for. So if you're looking for the word group because you don't know what the command is to pull up the groups, there it is. Um, and you can search through it until you find the one you want. And if I go info ls, it gives you the non-formal version of the instructions. In other words, it's giving you a slightly nicer English, doesn't want to make you poke out your eyes, version of basically the man page. But the funny thing is, is the man page and the info page aren't always the same. Some information will be in the man page, some information will be in the info page. Why is it not all in one place? I don't know. That's what Google is for. Um, because I've discovered that half the time it's faster to Google than to dig through the man pages. If I don't know how to do something, I open up on Google, and odds are it's going to be on Stack Overflow or Server Fault. Take your pick. They're usually in those places. And there, this one's kind of cool, though, because it actually gives you examples. So info gives you examples of how some of the commands work and how they behave. And I keep typing the Q to quit once I found what I wanted. Um, the absolute path. Again, I'm going to go like this and go to lecture two, like this. Now, in here, this is my present working directory. So the absolute path to my current location is this, slash root, slash lecture two dash 20 W. That's my absolute path to where I am. So this is the exact coordinates. On the other hand, so that means if I type in root slash lecture, regardless of where I am, so let's go bin, if I go slash root slash lecture 2 dash 20 W, it brings me there. Regardless of where I am in the file system, it'll bring me exactly to where I just told it to go because I'm giving it the full path to get there. On the other hand, if I went... I went back into the bin directory, and I tried to move relative to where I am now. That won't work because that lecture 220W does not exist one level up from where I'm at. So if I, and so on the other hand, if I decide to do this would work because I'm sitting in my home tree. It'll bump me up to where I was. Now, this is the tree of my home directory. See, there's dear one with that stuff, lab, a lecture, miscellaneous files in lecture two, and the ones I've been playing with right now while I was demonstrating. So those are absolute and relative paths. This is really important to know in Linux because there's some directories where the name repeats. For example, the bin directory exists in multiple places. There's, hang on, it's easier if I show you. So we have a bin folder right off the root. We have a bin off user. Um, Oh, the good news is it's not in here anymore. Uh, there's also a, do I have an opt? Oh, good, I emptied it. So because some folder names are, sh are in multiple places, sometimes it's, you're not 100% sure which one you're playing with. So you're better off, <coughs> excuse me, um, using an absolute path when you're trying to find things. 
That way you always know you're actually using the right one as opposed to using the relative path because then you're guessing where you're at. Um, for example, at work, I, one of my uh, fellow conspirators, I guess you them, was write, writing some Python scripts to interact with our uh, mass mailing software that we subscribe to. And he wrote, wrote these really fancy scripts and the first time we tried to run them automatically, they didn't work because he wrote all his paths relative. And because of where they had to reside, it didn't know where the other files were inside of its script unless he started using absolute paths inside his script. So it's usually safer to use absolute paths because, well, yeah, at least you know for a fact where you're going. Uh, relative paths are good if you're just moving around through the file system quickly as in you want to go up a directory, down a directory, that's fine. But if you need to address a file or a program, always use absolute paths if possible. Okay, I covered so much of that. All right, CP. See this presentation is 30 slides long and I just skipped four because I just covered it without flipping through them. Okay, CP. CP lets you copy files. It's amazing. Now, what's kind of cool about it though is, so see how I got file one, file two? So I created a directory called part two. It's over here. Now, see if, if I go CP file one into part two, if I go LS part two, you can see file one is in there. One of the nifty tricks that Linux has is you can copy multiple files at once. So what it'll do is it assumes all the arguments before the last argument are file names. So in this case, it's going to copy file one, file two, and mail cap, and shove them into part into a folder called part two. No error messages. And you can see now that the three files I copied are there. So unlike DOS and PowerShell, where last term you learned if you type in the copy command, it lets you copy one file or a pattern of files to a destination. This lets you list off a bunch of files with one destination. Um, if I want to be nice, use dash i for interactive or interrogate. Um, depending on who you ask, it, that i means more than one thing. I had one Linux prof teach it as interrogate, one had it as uh, interactive. Basically, it's asking you, sure you want to do this? So it's detecting that the file exists in the destination directory, and it says, do you want to overwrite it? Yes, yes, yes. And it goes Y or N, because it's handy that way. Copy, dash R does recursive. And if you include parent, it'll actually include the whole parent path. So that's kind of cool too. Um, U is only when the source file is newer or the file does not exist. Can anybody guess what the U stands for? Yeah. Only if it's newer, it does not exist. Therefore, U is for update. So at least that one's kind of easy to remember. If it's a newer file, dash U. Uh, dash B is cool. It creates a backup before you copy. So let's say that you know there's a file at the other end, but you want to make sure you don't lose it. So like, for example, log files, or maybe you have a text file full of addresses or whatever, and you don't want to lose the contents. You can actually use dash B. So if I go B, file one, two, no error messages, but if I go LS, part two, you'll see right here, they create a, a file called file one with a tilde. It's a Linux convention slash Unix convention that if it's a backup file or a scratch file, you append it with a tilde that says it's a backup. Yay. So if I do that again, 
it only creates one backup. So, you know, if you don't want to lose the previous backup, make a copy of that one first. It only ever keeps the previous copy of whatever is there. So if you do a backup, it overwrites the backup every single time you do it. So if I were to do a file one again, it would write overwrite file one Tilly a second time, third time and a fourth time. MV is move. In DOS, you have a command called rename. In Linux, you don't have a file, a command called rename. You have a command called move. So for example, let's say I want to move one into part two. The file one is gone. Yay. It's residing in part two now, but now it's completely gone out of here. However, move file two as file two. What it's going to do is I'm going to rename the file. So I don't know why they thought it was a good idea to use the move command to rename, but that's what they chose to do. So you rename by moving the file into a new name. Or you can also give it a path and the new name. So you can take file two, move it into part two, and give it a new name at the same time. If I do that, now you'll see that file two is now file two new. It has the same command options as copy. You can, oh shoot. You can I for integrity to make it interactive, B to make a backup first. So if you're going to move a file and there's one there, it'll make a copy of it. U, it'll only move it if it's new. Um, so that's the move command. You've got the cat command. Um, cat is cool, sort of. Cat lists the contents of a file. As you can see, it doesn't put breaks in it. So if you just want to output the contents of something, cat is better. Often you'll use cat with more. And that's totally useless. Such. You'll see that here. I can page through the file. All is good. Cat lists the contents of the file line by line, basically catalogs the file. And if you want to do the opposite, they decide to be cute. TAC, T-A-C. What's the opposite of cat? T-A-C. If I do that, it goes from the last line to the first line in reverse order. So it reads from the bottom to the top. As you can see now, like, all lines are reversed. Using it at their own rules, file, precedence, it's actually backwards than what it was in the file originally. If I go. See, that's the order it was in originally. TAC reverses it. Last line first. So it's good when you're, you're reading log files and you need to know what happened first. So you can walk your way backwards through it. And you can use it to concatenate files. So if I, what was the example you used? I go. So there's one file called FS tab. Let me clear the screen first. So that's the contents of a file called FS tab. And if I, and the file called. And there's the password file. I could actually I'm going to run this through more so you can see what happens. Right here is the FS tab, is this chunk right here. Oops. And this is the content of the password file. So you can use cat to grab multiple files and put them all together. Uh, some people might ask, well, what's the use of that? Let's say you are in the middle of trying to find out. You're running a web server and your web server is under attack. Most web servers, you have multiple log files for the web server. Each, even each virtual host will have its own log file. So you may want to see which one's getting hammered or which one's 
killing it. So you might want to cat all the different access logs as a single output so then you can parse the whole file in one go. So instead of parsing file one, file two, file three, file four, you could theoretically cat all the files together one after another and just treat it as one giant file to work with. You could even redirect that and create a file out of it. It's handy that way. Touch. <laughs> That's my favorite one. Touch is a command that lets you create an empty file. You're going to touch a file and it'll create some empty file so that way you can use it for a redirect. Now, now you can see that touch is there. It created a file called ABC. You can see it's empty because it's zero bytes. Um, one of the useful things is when you have a script that runs automatically, you can use touch to keep track of when certain steps happened because it creates a timestamp for each one. So, for example, right now you can see that touch was set for 1741. If I go touch ABC again, that's still 1741 because it's still 1741. Got to wait for the time to change. Hang on. But touch is a, is a nifty command to know because at least, you, like I said, you can use it to um, There we go. There it updated. Um, so yeah. So the touch command is easy to remember, you know. Touch but, touch, you know, friend. There's you can use it for all kinds of things. Um, there used to be actually an example in this which was really bad because you see touch child. Because we used to create a parent directory and a child directory, and the prof that created the slide wasn't an English speaker, so he never actually got what he was saying was inappropriate. So he goes, "I touch child." No, did not. <laughs> or you should not. So, you know, so now we just talk about touch. That's why I laugh when every time I see the touch command because it always reminds me of the fr when I inherited the slides the first time and it literally said touch child. I'm like, oh, am I going to say that out loud in class? No. Yes, I am going to use it as an anecdotal story. Um, so, yeah, touching a file is literally to create an empty file and or to keep track of a timestamp when certain things happen. The tree command. You may not have the tree command installed by default. Uh, it shows you a command line you can use to install it. Um, it shows a nice directory structure of how the directories are all arranged. Um, surprise, the hidden directories. Put dash all. Dash D only shows directories. You don't care about the files, you just want to know what the structure of the directory structures are. And then you also got, oh crap, what the hell is that? Dash L means to what level? I just couldn't remember what the format of the argument was. So I want two levels. So it only go current level and one down. So you only want to know two levels of the tree, not the entire tree. Because, for example, if I went right to the root and I did tree here, I'm, I'm running the tree for the entire operating system. Actually, I don't know how long this takes. This should be interesting. There's a lot of files in there. So, man, okay, never mind. Control C cancels, just so you know. Uh, but on the other hand, if I did tree two levels deep, there we go. That's a lot faster. It just shows you one level down. Kind of handy. So if I did, 
uh, tree dash L2, but I also only wanted the directories. Now there's no files. In actual fact, this would have been an interesting. Um, if I do tree dash D, now there's no files, but it shows just how many directories are in a Linux operating system. This is right out of the box. I haven't installed anything other than what gets installed when you install Ubuntu. So if you ever wondered, Linux loves directories. 48,483 of them. And that includes uh, one user home directory that I created and those couple of directories I created in the root folder. So yeah, so 48,470 directories or so are created by when you install Ubuntu. Other distributions will have slightly different number counts, but that's roughly what you get. Okay. This is one of the most powerful features in Linux. Output redirection. Because as you've noticed, all the commands that we've been running just go to the terminal, right? And they're just shooting past the screen, just And you have no control of what's going on. You have the ability to redirect input and output. So the greater than sign, which is going to be the same on DOS, output redirect it to a file. <coughs> so for example, if I go, I go home. So in here, there's not much in here, but if I go Trying to use FS tab. So if we do cat FS tab, it goes to the screen. If I so cat FS tab and I go, I create a file called FS tab example in the current working directory. There's no output, but now you'll see that it created a file called FS tab example. And now here's the contents of it. I've made a copy of this file by catting it to a file. There, that's kind of handy. On the other hand, remember when I ran this command? And it just ran forever? I could theoretically create a file called OS tree. Now, this ran instantly. As you noticed before, it took forever because it was scrolling, scrolling. That's actually how long it took just to draw it on the screen. It actually runs significantly faster. It's how long it takes to actually output one screen of text at a time. So if I were to go, and that didn't work. Okay, that made a liar out of me. Oh, that's stupid. Hang on. Really? I can't type today. Uh, there was supposed to be tree. Okay, that one took a little longer. There we go. No, not that. I'm going to go. So now I've got a file that shows me the directory structure of my entire disk. Why? I don't know why I'd want it, but, you know, I have it. That's one example of redirect. You can also do append, which is greater than, greater than. So if one greater than overwrites, what's more powerful than overwriting is appending. So you over greater than twice. And so if I were to go, um, so if I go cat fs tab, to file one, and that was bad, to file one. So I got a file one here, and currently inside of that is um, the contents of the FS tab. But if I were to go, um, and I'm gonna redirect and append, now when I look at that, you'll now see there's the FS tab plus, plus the directory structure, which is kind of cool. Um, 
actual fact, there's one more that's missing here, uh, which is pipe. Um, we actually do talk about redirection later in more detail because there's a few other tips and tricks you can do with redirection. Uh, because every command you run in Linux has two outputs. It has the output to the screen, and then it's got error. So there's the error stream where if there's something that goes wrong, it comes out this secondary path, and you can actually redirect both those outputs every time you run a command. Uh, but I cover that in detail later. Uh, the last redirect, which I actually showed you guys, uh, but it's not on the slides, is the, more, is the pipe. So remember I talked about the key above your enter key, the, the pipe. Um, what that does, it allows you to take the output of one command and send it to another command. So for example, if I have ls, so there's ls from bin. So this is the contents of my bin directory. These are all the commands, basically the command line tools that I can use. If I wanted to, I could go ls pipe into more. So what it's going to do is it's going to run the ls command, take the output, pass it to more, and then more will take the output of that command and allow you to manipulate it. So now I can go and... That's kind of stupid. There we go. So now I've got the same command that did the ls, but now I'm getting it piped into more. <coughs> All right. Now, there's another command that you can play with. It's called no clobber. Sounds like a stupid command. It allows you to accidentally to avoid overwriting files. So let's say you have a file you must not delete. And you're working and working and working, and you must not delete this file. You can choose to make the file not overwritable. Doesn't mean it's read only, it means you can't replace it. So there's a command called let's go home before I do this. Command called date. Guess what date does? It doesn't take you out for a date, it shows you when it is shows you when you're sitting at home alone. Date. And what I can do is I'm going to output date to file 1. Bang. So now if I look at file 1, I have a timestamp that's stored forever, so I know when I was alone. Now I can choose to make it no clobber. So I go set dash o no clobber. And you notice I'm not giving it a file name. What it's actually doing is it's saying, from here on out, I'm not allowed to uh, overwrite files. And now if I go date F1, cannot overwrite. Too bad you're not allowed to do this. Congratulations. It won't let you do it to any file. Any file. from As long as my session is active, for example, I could do the same thing, go uh, date output to ls out. It doesn't make a difference. It doesn't care what file. It basically, after you've issued that command, you cannot overwrite existing files. It's a fail-safe for when you, you know, you're having a day where you suck and you can't type and you keep making mistakes. I should have that mode turned on more often. Um, so dash O means if someone on reason dash O turns on no clobber but if I go plus O takes away no clobber I don't know why it's just the syntax it's just stupid it's stupid syntax at some point I guess somebody thought they'd be clever and we're going to take away the option no clobber. Now we're going to put the option of no clobber back in, but it does the opposite. It's like a double negative. So now, I, once again, I can actually go, I can override files to my heart's content now, and it won't complain. Uh, there's also a short version, which makes a lot more sense. 
minus C, negative clobber, no clobber. So now if I go do the date again, not allowed to do it. But now I'm a, yes, you positively make clobber files. And now I can overwrite files. So you've got two commands to do the same thing. One is very verbose and long, one is short and sweet. They do the same thing. Oh, there's the more command. I already covered that. I just covered it in the wrong order. Okay. Now, some people, when you administer a Linux environment, um, how many of you have actually worked in a store where they used a dumb terminal? Green screen? Text-based UI in a store? No? Holy crap, I'm getting old. Um... Anybody here go to Long and McQuaid recently? Anybody know what Long and McQuaid is? Okay, the musicians in the room should know what Long and McQuaid is. Those that aren't musicians, well, it's a music store. They actually, the software they use, I actually worked for the company that wrote it originally, years ago. It sucks ass. It is terrible. Actually, all the workers hate it. But it is a dumb terminal-based application. It was written 30 years ago. And they bought it not that long ago because it does what it's supposed to do. It's just, you know, it allows for multi-location type setup. And it's green screen based. And so when they go to use it, they double click on an icon, it launches a terminal, and they have to log in using a text-based command prompt. And then, depending on what the, how the user set up, they actually have to type in a command to actually launch the point of sale system. It's amazing. Somehow that works with the, the Interact machines and the local printers and everything. I have no idea. Um, because back when I worked for the company, there was no point of sale machines. And local printers were a dream. You know, a laser printer would cost like a 900 bucks. Um, so, but what often happens is when people log into a Linux system, the administrators try to get cute and they create custom prompts for them. So that, as you can see right now, when you look at my prompt, you can see that my prompt is my user at my current host name, my current path, and then that's you know, the pound signs identifying that it's a command prompt. I can actually change these and you can give it different arguments. So you can see the arguments here is user at host colon working directory, and there's a bunch of other th ones in here. So, for example, I could go, oh, darn. Now you can see that my prompt has changed. Now I always know when it is. T is time. So now if I keep moving around, you can see that my time's changing every time I do anything. It's the current time. I always know what time it is. Yay. Um, S means shell. Best part, N is new line. I can have a prompt that's multiple lines. So I could actually get really fancy and go uh, date, actually no, new line, dash T for time, uh, at dash, oh shoot, at host, so now I got this brutal prompt. Every single time I run a command, it's two lines long. There's all kinds of things you can do with this. Uh, use user. Shh, come on, don't do that to me. Um, and then there's an option for the secondary prompt. So sometimes, let me just set my prompt back to what it was because I really hate. Oh, stop that. Host, we're in directory. There we go. Now everything's happy again. 
and there's the secondary prompt. If I go ls backslash, so when you put in a backslash at the end of a command, it says there's more coming, but it's coming on a new line. So in theory, I can go multiple lines of commands, and then there's like, you know, nothing there. Um, the secondary prompt is this. So you can actually feed it the same arguments. So you can have your secondary prompt be more obvious of what this is. So I could go um, PS2 Give me more. Not really him. Not all that useful, but you know. Bring it back to what it was. You can change your prompt if you decide to get fancy. Um, there's actually options to color code it too, but that starts getting really, really fancy. Um, you can actually make it have colors and um, not Bash doesn't support it, but ZSH allows you to actually like have rainbow effects. So you can actually have like all the letters rotating through colors. No idea why, but you can. Um, the WC command is kind of handy. It counts the contents of a file. So you can get it to count the words, how many lines, or how many characters. So if I did word count It gives me the number of words. Hang on, what the heck is that? That makes no sense. So, 12 lines. That's 656 characters. What's the last argument? Words. There's our um, 88. 88 words. Anything that's separated out with a space. So if I go wish my mouse is still going to sleep. That's one word, that's two words, that's three words, four, five, six words, seven, eight, nine, ten. We can see we could sit there and count all eighty eight if we wanted to, but there's eighty eight words. Um, now, some people are wondering, well, what use is that? The character count, I'm not such a, I don't see a use for, it for much for, but the line count's the most handy one. It allows you to see how big a file is. So in theory, you could have a process that's constantly touching, a, updating a file, the contents of a file, and you want it to keep track of how many lines get written out every time. So you go WC-L, it counts the number of lines in the file. Wait a little longer, do it again, then you can see if the file's been updated. Uh, I often use it to see if log files have changed. Because even if a process touches a log file, the timestamp may change even if it didn't do anything to the log file. So you can't use the current time as saying, hey, the content's changed. And if it's a case where the log file changes many times, you might lose track of how fast the contents change. Um, let me uh, show you an example really quick. Hope I can connect. Oh, come on. It's not going to work today? Oh, I'm not doing that example. Maybe it'll come back. No. Nope. Our gateway at work. I was going to go connect our primary web server and I'll show you what happens when a log file is really busy. Uh, but I guess that's not going to happen. Our uh, Amazon endpoint seems to be not having a happy day today. That's not great. Um, that explains other problems. But word count lets you count the, the words. Um, if you need to see the contents of a file, tail, head, more, less, cat, and tack. I showed you guys cat already. Shows you the contents of a file top to bottom. Tack reverses it. Less is more. Somebody thought they were cute. I had to create a command called less, and it's an alias of more. They do the exact same thing. So less is more because, you know, more does the job. Um, tail shows you the last 10 lines, but you can give it arguments that let you show more than the last 10 lines. And head shows you the first 10 lines in a file. 
And okay, let's try this again. Oh, yay. That's great. All right, so got lots of log files in here, right? Um, so here's the tail. That's the last 10 lines. Tail, I can say go last 20 lines by just telling it the number of lines. I can also tell it to follow. And what this will do is show the updates as it goes. And there you go, somebody just accessed one of our sites. That's what that line was. Somebody hit that site, there you go. So, actually this is somebody checking to see if their demo software is allowed to run. <laughs> That's what's happening right now. Um, actual fact, if I pick a different server, I got one that's way better than this for this example. I think that's the one I need. No? There we go. That's me. I just loaded the prime the first web page on our website. You can see oh there we go, somebody else is browsing our website. So that's tail. Tail's cool because it lets you follow the end of the file. So tail dash f allows you to see the end of the file. That's every time somebody hits a web server, that's what's happening on the web server. You know when you load a web page, you're like, cool, I loaded this web page. It's loading more than one thing. It's loading lots of stuff. And that's what the web server sees. On this token, there's also the error log where you can keep track of errors. So when you are trying to figure out why a piece of code is not working on a web page, you can actually watch the error log and watch the errors go by. Um, lots of those today in my world. Um, so that's tail. Head does the same thing. It reads the first 10 lines. You can't really follow the head because the head doesn't change. But the tail follows. It's great. Um, more, again, I showed you guys more than once. Now, so that's tail, more, those are useful ones. There's a command called cut. Cut is cool. Cut allows you to strip text out of file, so it doesn't actually cut the file. It allows you to cut pieces of the file and output it. So for example, if I identify which field you want. So when we look at the etc password file, This file is a very busy file. There's lots of stuff in here. Um, but you can see that all the pieces of data are delimited by colon. There's colons everywhere in this. Colon, colon, colon. So if I go cut dash D and the delimiter is a colon, and I go dash field one. Field one happens to be usernames. It gives me a list of all the usernames. If I actually want to know other things like fields one and three, it gives me the first field and the third field. It still keeps it delimited by a colon, but it allows you to grab the bits and pieces that you want. One, two, three, four, five. On the other hand, if I want to know what the user is and their next name, I can grab fields one and five. So field one is their username, field five is their description, also known as their nice name. And here you can see a bunch of things like time synchronization, bug reporting system, the kernel oops tracking daemon. 
when the kernel shits the bed, there's an actual process that actually pays attention to what the kernel just did. And the process is actually attached to a user, and it's called kernoops. Um, RT kit is real time, pulse is for the audio system, all kinds of stuff in here. So that's what cut does. Now you can take paste, which is take the contents of one and puts it in the other. So you take file one, file two, and it merges the contents of the two files. Um, the easiest way for me to demonstrate that is <laughs> man, I really botched my uh, prompt. There we go, that's better. Now, I'm going to create a file. And I'm going to go C1. In here, I'm going to go 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. And I'm going to create that file. I'm going to create the file 2, which has part of the alphabet. So now I've got two files, C1, C2. So if I go paste, paste, C1, C2, it builds a file that lines up each of the, so each, the contents of each file gets added on to the right. So it basically builds a, like a table for you of all the contents of the files. Um, paste works well with cut. So if you're trying to build uh, a series of files based on the contents of more than one file. You can actually use cut from one, paste into the other, and magically you can build a new file out of those two steps. Uh, it's up to your imagination what you do with it. But it's the handy commands. History, which you just saw me use, because I, I, I didn't want to type in the whole command. History is all the commands you've typed into your shell. So if I type in, type in history, uh, 745 commands I've typed since I've installed this version of Linux. Um, there you can see right here where I was creating my lectures. This is actually from last year. So years worth of commands are still stored in this. All the way back. Now if I type in the history-c command, it nukes your contents of your history, clears your history. I'm not doing that because I actually want to keep my, my history. <coughs> um, if you want to know where your history file is, there's an environment available called hist file. It shows you that my history is contained in dot bash history. And there's also an option for hist size. Hist size means how many commands back am I going to keep? By default, Ubuntu keeps 1,000 commands. So the last 1,000 commands you typed into the command prompt, it remembers. Um, there's a lot of jokes, like, you know, programmer jokes that show someone going through their history because they don't feel like typing in, like, ls-la, so they start typing, hitting the up key until they find ls-la, even though it's more characters than the one they need, right? Um, so, if I go type in history one more time, so you'll see I've got a couple of different commands in here. There's one more thing you can do with the history, which is cool. You can use the ban, bang exclamation mark, known as bang. You can reference a command in your history. If you know what the command number is, so for example, let's say I want to run the clear command. Clear is at 740. I can go bang 740. And there. It's shorter than writing clear. Now, mind you, to do that, I actually typed in history first, so it's actually more commands, letters. But if you're doing a, like a more complex command, like for example, the cut command right here, and you, you don't want to type the whole thing in in case you make a mistake. Then, in theory, I could go bang 734. And there, there's my cut command one more time. There, I'm getting lazy now. I'm not even typing in the commands anymore. I'm just pulling up from my history. 
um, you can say, hey, I, can, I know it, it's, it's four commands ago. So if I went history, I want to make sure I don't do something destructive here. One, two, three, four, five. I could actually go bang minus five. I know I did this five commands ago. So from my, the most recent entry, go back five, which happens to be clear was five ago. Uh, I could say bang, oops, bang minus two, and there's my, that cut command I did. Um, and what's cool is if you press up, it doesn't even show you what you did. It just keeps track, you know, because you didn't create a new history command. You used one that's already there. So, and if you want to rewind the exact same command you did a minute ago, you can go bang, bang. Now, if I go clear, and I do a bunch of stuff, and I go clear, oh, that's not good. Clear, it's that, but I could also do that again. It'll just keep clearing my screen over and over and over again. So if there's a certain command you want to do all the time, you can just go bang, bang, last command you did. Um, or, you know, you could also go up. Press the up key. Enter. And so it's actually technically up and enter is actually less keystrokes than bang, bang. But, you know, it's all good. Um, now, sometimes you need to know which command you're running because Linux also often has multiple copies of the same binary depending on what you're trying to do. So there's the which command. Not which as in, you know, a which. Which as in which one. Um, so if I ask which more, it shows me that if I run the more command, it's going to grab it out of the bin directory. If I go which vim, shows me under user bin vim. So it shows you where the executables are. This is a command I really wish Windows had. Because sometimes you've got a process that's running, you don't know where it's running from. If only you could actually just go to the command prompt and say which one's being run, it would tell you which one's being run. Um, and then dash a shows all matches. So if I go which dash a, more is a bad example. I wonder if there's, okay, yeah. Let's go which cp. There's just this one. If I go, there's only one copy of cp. Anyways, if you go dash a and there's more than one command, it'll show all the places it's stored. Obviously the first one in the list is the one that's always being executed because it's the first one it would find. Uh, now where is? allows you to tell you where certain things are. So if I go, where is um, Vim? So it shows me where the program is. It shows me that there's aliases for it. So there's Vim Basic, Vim Tiny. The Vim control file is here that shows you what the settings are. Uh, the directory of Vim is contained. Where the man files are for Vim. So it shows you anywhere where it finds Vim. V-I-M. Anywhere where those five, that word shows up. You can also tell it to just look for the binaries. So that means any programs. That's a binary. Or I just want to find where the man pages are. So if you need to go fix your man pages. Um, and which will not apply. S is for source. Um, this is more from back in the dark ages where when you installed programs on Unix or Linux, you actually downloaded the source code. And then you went into the source code directory and you'd go uh, um, make. And you crossed your fingers. Then you hoped you didn't have error messages. And then it would actually build the executable and then you'd install your executable and put it where you want it to go. Um, so normally when you had the source code, you needed to know where this source code was. So this would help you find the source code. Um, I'm pretty sure I don't have any source code on here. Oh, I do. So if I go, where is headers? Uh, okay, if I go, where is Linux dash headers? Really? Probably not going to let me do it. That's not working. Oh well. Yes, for source. 
you don't really need to use this just to memorize dash s as source. Um, alias, remember earlier I discussed somebody renamed uh, pwd to where am I? Aliases allow you to define your own command. So let's say you have a command you use all the time. For example, if you always use ls-la, so you never actually want to use ls, you just want to use the long version. You can actually declare alias my ls is equal to, so now I can actually run the command my ls. You can alias an existing command, so I can actually change ls to be always the long version if I chose. So if I went alias ls equal to ls-la, now if every time I type in ls, it's always going to be the long version now, not the short version. And you can choose to un-alias ls, and now ls is back to being itself. Um, so you can alias and create a new direct command. Unalias makes it go away. All right. That was a lot of commands real fast. Um, so that's the basic command line tools you'll find in pretty much all Linux installs. And once you get a hang of using these, the OS becomes fairly easy to maneuver around. It's just a little into unintuitive for people that are used to click, 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 or even tap, 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 scroll, 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 tap, tap, two scrolls. I'm on a Mac. I'm going to go sideways, right? <laughs> I'm making fun of Macs. Um, but just saying, you know, you have um, people that are used to working with gestures and mice find a bit of a learning curve at this point where because you're so used to not actually having to think about what's actually happening because you just show it what you want it to do. This will force you to actually tell it what to do and you'll actually understand what you're doing better with the operating system. Um, and Linux has a lot of this stuff. Now, people ask me, well, how much of this stuff do you need to know for the tests? Because you know, at that point, people see all these slides with all these parameters. The good news is the tests for this course are basically memorization tests. For you, those of you that can't memorize worth a shit, too bad. There's more understanding type questions later when you learn about bash scripting, but for the first, just so you know, for the first test, which is scheduled for the week just before the break, it's literally memorization is go, what's the command that used to list the contents of a directory? The answer is ls. What is the argument for ls that lets you see all the contents? A, what lets you see the, the, all the details, L, right? That kind of stuff. So those are the kinds of questions you'll get. So it's more understanding what the parameters are, more than the, what it is. Yes? It's always multiple guess. <laughs> um, they've passed down the edict that all major assessments must be done on paper. Um, that's any assessment worth more than 20%, uh, more than 15% of your grade is required to be done on paper. Uh, you can thank a specific subset of students for that. Uh, the ones that are happily busy cheating. And, uh, there's, there's so much cheating happening with Brightspace that our department has said no more of that. C'est la vie. Um, I hate that as much as you do because that means I have to grade them instead of you getting your grade automatically, but it will be an automagical, it'll be Scantron. So it'll be fun, I guarantee it. No, it's not. Um, but yeah, so it is a written test. It's multiple guess. If it's Scantron, it's always multiple guess. I can't stand people's handwriting. So I refuse to do fill in the blank questions. Uh, people can't write with a crap anymore, uh, myself included. All right, so once again, as last reminder, this week you're working on lab two. If you haven't shown me lab one, you really need to show me lab one and or upload your screenshots. If you've already uploaded your screenshots, you don't need to come and show me because it's going to be hard to do the rest of the coursework if you don't have it installed. So I'll know right away if you just get me, gave me screenshots of someone else's install just to give you points. Believe it. Yes, that happens lots. 
Um, especially after people figure out they can change their prompt. After the first lecture, they change their prompt. Say, look, it's a screenshot of my install. No, it's not. Um, other than that, uh, that's it for this week. I'll see everybody in labs through the week for those that choose to come.